Halloween 2 by Jack Martin. Chapter 2. Bracket, he thought, where are you when you're needed? He stood by the station wagon. He had found it here empty, had spent the last half hour searching the yards and surrounding area. There was no place to hide, and yet he was hiding, somewhere, very close by. Loomis could feel it, waiting to strike and move on. And all the while time was passing, too much time. To hell with you and your tired schedule, Sheriff, he thought. Your normal methods won't work tonight, not any more. Loomis unpocketed his gun, opened the cylinder, held it to the moon, and spun the chambers. Loaded. It was all he needed to know. He left the station wagon and started out again on his own. After several blocks, a pair of saucer-eyed headlights knifed abruptly out of an alley and caught him square in the face. He held up his hand. The car braked. Brackett got out slowly, almost casually. "'Where were you?' said Brackett. "'I went back to the Myers house. "'I found the car. He's here.' "'Where?' Brackett's voice tightened. Three blocks down. Get in the car,' Loomis ordered. There was no time to reason. "'Go up that side street and then back down here. "'Keep watching. I'm going ahead.' Brackett swallowed hard and dropped his cigarettes. A moment later, he was swinging wide in a U-turn. Loomis kept walking. He was close now. He could all but smell it, taste it. There was an aura in the town, hanging like a cloud over the ordinary lives that played out in these ordered streets and houses. Safe and sane lives that knew nothing of the chaos that might erupt at any second and blow their safe harbor out of the water. He did not envy them their complacency. Enjoy your haven while you can, he thought. It may not last much longer. Lined up for a slaughterhouse, Brackett had said that. The sheriff did not know how right he was. Is that what you all want to be, lambs to the slaughter? Wake up, he thought. I should scream bloody murder at the top of my lungs. Would that startle you out of your warm beds and into action? No. You would only think it another Halloween jake the final ritual of a holiday that long ago lost its meaning. A child's game made of nothing more substantial than colored paper and bobbing apples and cardboard broomsticks. Except that the ones who's playing the game tonight is no child. And to him, it is no game. Loomis came to another street, a peaceful tree-lined lane filled with more classic two-story houses and old oaks. It was no different from any other street in this section of town. He paused under a grove of trees, strung with crepe paper, streamers blowing in the wind. He noted the corner, getting his bearings. It was a wide street with close crop lawns and well-kept yards, tidy and conservative. Loomis was not reassured. Now a last echo of Halloween play sounded from one of the yards, squealing laughter. It lifted on the night air and rose over the housetops, to be lost on the rustling autumn wind. The sound set his teeth on edge. Nothing seemed simple or normal to him any more. He tried to hold the irrational side of his nature in cheek, but it was of no use. In terms of what he knew now, the wailing might as easily have been the keening of banshees. Where was the distinction? Just then, a little boy came running from the porch of a house on the other side of the street. A late trick-or-treater, thought Loomis. But really... Where was the dividing line between ritual and reality, between costume play-acting and genuine monsters? Was the difference only in how seriously one played the game? Take that little tyke, for instance. He's running like he believes the gates of Hades have really opened behind him, tripping over his costume, his face smeared with makeup. His wailing certainly seems genuine enough. Who's to say it isn't so? Do I know what he has seen? Does anyone? It's real to him. We should all be so easily convinced. Perhaps it would increase our potential for survival. His wailing, Loomis frowned. The little boy wasn't laughing, he was crying. He was beyond tears. Someone must have played a particularly frightful joke on him. And his costume? It wasn't a costume, the child was in his pajamas. And his face, it was not a mask and it was not makeup. It was smeared with... what? Could it be blood? Loomis stiffened. He heard more crying, screaming, above the sudden pounding of the pulse in his ears. A little girl with dark hair, flying, came from behind the boy. Was she chasing him? No. 
Fear contorted her face into an expression of sheer horror. She was too terrified even to glance back over her shoulder at whatever she was running from. Loomis had not seen such an expression in years, not since the police photographs of the faces of the two victims who were slashed to death 15 years ago in this very town, only a few blocks away. Now the two children were tearing across the lawn, the sidewalk, slapping dark outlines of their tiny feet on the pavement. Loomis took quick steps. The children spotted him but kept running, screaming even louder. They passed him, trying desperately to grab hands, but pulling apart as their toes scraped cement. They were running for their lives. Help! they shrieked. Help, Mr. the Boogeyman! Keep going! shouted Loomis. Don't stop and don't look back, no matter what you see or hear. He's in the house. He's... Get your asses out of here! Loomis yelled. The house, not the old Myers house this time, not his old stomping grounds, another house, apparently. One picked at random. But why? Because, thought Loomis, there's no one left to kill in the Myers house. He has to seek new blood. Why didn't I think of that? Loomis sprinted full out across the lawn. Before he got to the porch, he heard more screaming inside, upstairs. The door stood open on darkness. He kicked it back and jumped inside. His eyes were already attuned to the dark. He raised the gun and braced his arm with his other hand. He crouched and swung his body in a half circle, sweeping the room, straight-arming the gun from side to side in front of him. The old light fixture in the ceiling creaked, vibrating. The sounds of a struggle upstairs. The metallic smell of blood in the air. There. At the top of the landing, legs and ankles moving in a spastic dance, feet lifting off the floor, squirming and kicking, dragged away down the hall. Loomis mounted the stairs two at a time. He flattened against the wall. A girl, a teenage girl, was dangling at the end of the landing. She was held around the throat by two huge white hands. The hands were attached to the heavy, muscular arms of a tall, very tall shape, wearing a mask. It was him! Loomis aimed. He couldn't get a clear shot. The girl, she could no longer scream. She was reaching up, clawing at the pelled death's head in front of her in a last mad spasm. As Loomis watched, the rubber mask wrinkled and slid up under her fingernails. The shape let go of her just long enough to pull the mask back down. Then the head tilted to one side, observing like an animal, curious, utterly detached. The girl's mouth opened and she screamed again. It was a scream that curdled Loomis's blood, a scream of someone who at that instant might have wished she had never been born. Loomis cocked the hammer with both thumbs and sighted at the mask. It had been raised only an instant, but long enough to reveal the inconceivably bland, emotionless features of a face free of any feeling, a creature so devoid of any recognizable human expression that it was capable of absolutely anything. It could as easily tear the arms and legs from a human being as from a fly, with no inner restraints, conscience, or guilt, no hesitation, no consideration of the consequences, and no remorse, no conscience. A perfect killing machine, a pure and simple alien ego devoted entirely to its own subhuman purposes. It had not been born of man and woman, through them but not of them, an imposter in human-like form. A simulacrum catapulted here across generations of evolution from the dawn of prehistory to subvert and destroy the accomplishments of an entire species. I will not have it, thought Loomis savagely. In the name of my own kind and all that we have come to stand for, I send you back to the darkness from which you were spawned. You go to hell, Michael Myers, or whatever your name really is. Now! Without hesitation, Loomis pulled the trigger. There was a sound like thunder in the closed hallway. The bullet struck the shape in the chest and knocked it off its feet. The girl fell back to the wall. Loomis started toward her, one hand extended. It's all... All right now, he started to say, but the shape sat up. It got to its feet as if it had not been shot at all. He took point-blank aim and squeezed off two more rounds. The explosions were so loud they might have been a single shot. The moment was slowed down dreamlike. Loomis saw the slug slam into the chest. Each shot knocked the shape back farther on the landing, holding it at bay. 
but only temporarily each time, as it regained its footing and kept coming. Loomis braced his back against the wall and pumped off three more shots rapid fire straight into the chest until the gun clicked in his hands. As each shot hit, the shape was driven back toward the second story balcony, freezing the scene in stages like flashes of lightning. The empty chambers clicked and clicked as the shape jerked backwards and over the balcony railing. Loomis clicked the trigger again. Through smoke from the muzzle, he saw the shape fall backwards through space and into the darkness outside. A long second later, he heard the thud of the body hitting the ground. Then there was only the sound of the girl whimpering against the wall. Loomis lowered his trembling arms. His lips curled back over his teeth. It was over. The adrenaline pounded in his body. His knees unlocked and when he went to her, bending over her, his kidneys throbbing with pain. She was flecked with blood, her own. The sleeve was torn away from her blouse, revealing a long, clotted gash like lips in her white skin. Her face. She was young, no more than sixteen or seventeen. She might have been much younger, the way her face was distorted. She could almost have been a child in grade school. She was not crying. She was sobbing, broken. The effect was pathetic. Loomis felt his heart wrench. He started to reach out to comfort her but thought better of it. He sat down next to her. At the end of the landing, droplets of dark blood reflected moonlight. Loomis massaged his arm. It felt sprained, nearly crippled from the recoil of the revolver. The gun metal was hot in his hand. He set it down. He felt no satisfaction in the moment, only a numb relief. The girl's sobbing continued. Go ahead, he thought. Just be sure you're weeping for yourself and not for him. Spill the tears he never shed. Spill it like his black blood. Half-formed words were struggling in her throat. Don't, he almost said. Words mean nothing now. They never have. All my words were not enough. Down the days and years of therapy. A game. That's all they were. A poor way to try to deal with the reality of his presence in our midst. Words fell me even now. They were not enough when it counted, and they will never be enough again. Was, was it, was it the boogeyman? Managed the girl in a pitiful child's voice. He had to watch her mouth and listen closely. The echo of the gunshot still clogged his ears. Loomis took a long time answering, trying to find the right words. Words that would mean anything at all. Finally, they came to him with great effort, as if he were being re-educated to their use. As a matter of fact, he said, it was. The girl went on sobbing. His words neither frightened nor comforted her. She was past that. She had seen the face of evil up close, and she would never be the same again. A shot of morphine, he thought. That's what she needs. Obliteration, total and complete, for as long as she needs it until forgetfulness can do its merciful work and allow her to heal, if it's not already too late for her. He forced himself up and went over to the balcony. He cupped his palms over the sides of his head and popped his ears. The wind swelled the trees, but he could not hear it. If a police siren or ambulance was on its way, he could not hear that either. Someone will have heard, he thought. The shots were like cannon fire, unless the good neighbors on this block have been sleeping the sleep of the dead. His eyes took in the grass below. Let me hold this last picture of him in my mind forever he thought, for the longest day that I live. Whenever I'm afraid, whenever anyone is afraid, I will be able to dredge it up from memory and be assured that he and the evil he represents are no more. The balcony, the flower trellis, the grass below, where he had fallen. The lawn, which was now empty. He slapped the wall with his hand, turned, grabbed the gun and staggered down the stairs, out the door, into the yard. He dropped to his knees there, a patch of flattened wet grass which still held the outline of a body. It looked as if it had been burned into the ground. He reached out, feeling the compressed blades of grass against his skin. The grass was smooth when you rubbed it in one direction, rough the other. It was wetter in the center, very wet, wet with his blood. Loomis drew away from it and stood, staring wildly around the yard, the waving branches, the smudges that were garden tools around the periphery, the sky and the night, nothing else. 
A porch light winked on at the house next door. A man in nightclothes leaned into the darkness, shading his eyes, peering out between two grinning pumpkins on his porch. Just what is going on out there? Call the police, said Loomis reflexively. Tell the sheriff I've shot him. Who? Loomis's throat cleared, and he found the full strength of his voice. Tell him he's still loose. The man clutched his pajamas and swayed uncertainly. Is this some kind of joke? I, I've been trick-or-treated to death tonight. Loomis held to the gun, the empty gun. This is it, he thought. I should have guessed. Halloween is over. The games, the rolls, the cheap thrills. Now it really begins. You don't know what death is, he said. He was on his way out of the yard. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 2 of Halloween 2, the novelization by Jack Martin. I do apologize for the short upload, but I've been having some internet problems where it's going on and off, on and off, and I don't want to make sure that I get it, at least a chapter recorded for you guys, and I get it uploaded as quick as possible before I have the problem again. Um, I'm going to have this fixed within the next day or two at the latest, but I will do my best to at least get a chapter out tomorrow. But, uh, yeah, let's talk about Chapter 2. It was a very short upload, and again, I apologize, but I think it was kind of cool because it's more of a recap than what I thought it was because, you know, I was thinking it's just a recap of what we already read in Part 1. But really, that book was from Lori's perspective, you know. We kind of got the, the recap from Loomis's perspective, and I thought that was really neat. So I really enjoyed this chapter. Um, I enjoyed this part of the movie. And uh, I'm looking forward to the rest of it, and I hope you guys are too. Sorry for the delay between uploads. I promise I'll be getting them out quicker now. But uh, yeah, let me know what you think of the book so far, what you thought of Chapter 2. And I'll be back very, very soon with more and longer uploads of Halloween 2 by Jack Martin. As always, tonight's upload was brought to you by our patrons on the Patreon page. Carl Eakins, Catherine McClear, Sean Campbell, Cecilia Spears, Hawaii... Iron Elixir, and our newest patron, Saib. Thank you guys so much for supporting the channel. It's greatly appreciated. And if uh, somebody's out there listening right now that would like to help the channel out more and help see the channel keep going and growing for years to come and get some awesome rewards for doing so, check out the link in the description below. You can become a patron for as low as 2 to 5 bucks per month. Alright guys, until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying, thanks for listening and Death has come to your town. There's a lover in the story, but the story's still the same. There's a lullaby for suffering and a paradox to blame. But it's written in the scriptures and it's not some idle claim. You want it darker. We kill the flame. Lining up the prisoners and the guards who take an aim. I struggled with some demons, they were middle class and tame. I didn't know I had permission to murder and to maim. You want it darker? Darker.